Thank you. Thank you, and I'm really, really glad to be here. Uh, you know, I heard so much about Google offices, and I wanted all the time to come here, but nobody let me in. So I decided I'll sit for two years every day, write a book, and then I, maybe I'll be invited. And it worked, so <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, today I want to talk uh, about uh, how our physical sensations influence our behaviors, thoughts, emotions, judgments, decisions, uh, what I call in the book the new science of physical intelligence. Uh, in order to understand that, I would like to talk a little bit about embodied cognition. Embodied cognition actually says what I said actually a minute ago, that our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are grounded in our bodily states. Later on, I'll explain what I mean exactly by grounded in our physical states. But for the moment, let me say that embodied cognition uh, demonstrates our physical uh, sensations influence ev almost everything we do. What we see, what we hear, what we smell, without our awareness influences what we do. And a nice example of it is when you examine common metaphors like a warm person, a soft uh, negotiator, clean conscious, uh, emotionally close. Pay attention to the fact that we use um, concrete concepts to describe more abstract concepts. And these are the actually what metaphors are. And a lot of researchers believe that they are not only demonstrations of this association between concrete a, a concept to up such concept, but actually they're part of the process. So when I'll try now to show you how these metaphors are more than just a figure of speech, but show how our physical sensations are related to our behavior, emotions, and thoughts. Let's start with temperature. The things we touch, they may be cold, they may be warm. And let me start telling you about one study which I like specifically. This study was conducted by William and Barge. I will not repeat all the researchers. I have all of them on the, my presentation. I could tell you later on about the names, but this is really important, so I'll say the names. And they're from Yale University. And what it did was they asked participants to come to an experiment. And the, each participant, when he came to the Yale building, the psychology Yale building, was met by an experimenter who followed him and tol told him, let's go to the fourth floor in the elevator. What the participants didn't know is that the experiment started already while they were in the elevator. Uh, the experimenter asked the participant, can you hold your, my coffee for a minute while I'm writing your name? And she gave the coffee and then she took it back. That's all. Uh, to half of the participants, she gave a cold cup of coffee, an iced coffee. To the other half, she gave a warm cup of coffee. And then they came to the lab. They didn't even remember, probably, that they had this coffee. They came to the lab, and they were asked to evaluate person A. They were told that person A is intelligent, brilliant, industrious, all the things that you see here, determined, practical, and cautious. And they were asked to evaluate that person on several traits or characteristics. Half of them are related to a warm personality, like friendly or nice, and half are not related. What happened was, and this is really, I think it's amazing, is that participant who held a warm cup of coffee in the elevator just a few minutes earlier, rated person A as a more warm, a warmer person than those who held a cold cup of coffee. And when they were told, of course, they didn't think it had anything to do with the coffee. They asked, why do you think this person is warm? They gave all kinds of answers. Nobody thought it was because he or she held a hot, warm cup of coffee in the elevator. So that's an experiment, actually, that influenced me a lot. And I went deeper into thinking about it. And actually, it influenced a lot of people. And then a lot of ex experiments came out after that. And I will describe some of them. But before that, these same experimenters experimenters uh, did another experiment. They asked people to hold either a cold or a warm therapeutic pad as if it's part of a 
marketing research. So half of the subjects held a warm one, half held a cold one, and uh, they were asked all kind of question about the product. Then in an uh, they asked, thank you very much for participating. I want to reward you for your participation. Please choose a, either a gift for yourself or a gift for a friend. What happened was that 75% of the participants uh, who held a cold cup of, a cup of coffee, I'm saying a therapeutic pad, chose a gift for themselves, and only 25% chose a gift for somebody else. While those who held a warm a therapeutic pad, 46% of the participants chose a gift for themselves, and 54%, a little bit more than half, chose a gift for a friend. That means that just the fact that they held something warm made them more generous. So there are more studies done on uh, the influence of temperature, like it enhances trust, but I'll go on because I have a limited time. So I'll go to the next physical sensation, which is weight. We hold things that may be heavy and may be light, and there are many metaphors that show that. You say heavy decision, weighty matters, weighty uh, options. And what do we mean by that? We mean that there is an association between weight and importance. Heavy decision mean, means that it's an important decision. So let's see if indeed when people hold something heavy, they think that thing that they are reading on that heavy thing is more important. So what they did in this study, they had two groups of participants who read a resume of a job candidate. The resume was exactly the same for both groups, only one difference. One group was holding it on a heavy, relatively heavy clipboard, while the other group was holding it on a relatively light clipboard. They were holding it by while it was standing, so they felt whether it was heavy or not. Participants who held the heavy clipboard rated the candidate as a better one for the job than those who held the light clipboard. Remember, the only difference was the, the weight of the clipboard. It was exactly the same resume. They did another study where they asked people to answer a survey about how much they think different public issues should be funded, like air pollution or education, all kinds of things, how much they should be funded. And again, some of the people held it on a heavy clipboard, while the others held it on a relatively light clipboard. Again, what came out is that those that held the heavy clipboard, in this case I wrote men, and that's not, I, I'll explain you in a minute why men and not women, but men who held the uh, heavy clipboard believed uh, public f affairs should be funded more than those who held a light clipboard. This result did not come out when women were involved, and one of the reasons could be that women in general, and there are studies that show that, are more inclined to say you should be, these things should be funded. So there is kind of a ceiling effect that that's why uh, it didn't come out for women. But for men, the weight mattered. Now, let's go to vision a little bit. Tell me, what does the uh, red color, what, what are your associations with the red color? Yeah. Danger. 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 What else? Only danger? I need the other things too. Stop. Stop, right. What else? Blood. Blood, yeah. You're all in the same area. Sorry, I could hear. Yeah, great. I was, like, I was looking for this answer <laughs> too. To valid. Okay, so you're all right, and we all have this association. We have this association of passion and lust. And we have the association that you say, danger, stop signs. And it depends on the context, because it has several associations. And I want to show you several studies that check it from all this, those, these angles. So the first study is more associated with what you said first, danger, stop, uh, et cetera. There were three groups of participants that were given a verbal test. In this case, it's anagrams. It's, uh, it's a test that you get scrambled letters and you have to change it to a word. And you have to do it as fast as possible. All three groups got the same exact test. 
only one difference. If you notice, the participant number had different color. One group had a red participant number, and the other two had different colors, OK? And what happened was that students in the condition with the red participant color performed worse than those in the other colors. Now, I want to emphasize, you can say, you know, it was by mistake or something. They did it again and again with more verbal tests, with mathematical tests. They did it in Germany and in the United States. They did it with high school and they did it with college students. Always came the same result. When there was some red mark on the, on the uh, test, usually the participant number sometimes did something else, uh, the, uh, it, it decreased the performance, the performance worse. Why is that? Uh, I'm, I'm surprised that you laugh because I thought that people in Google never saw this mark. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but some other people did. And one of the reasons, that's not the only reason, there, is, there are also evolutionary explanations about that you say blood and all that. But definitely re we are reinforced by all kind of signs that say stop danger or the teacher that makes all these signs. And then the, one of the explanations is that when you read a test or when you are, you are performing a test and you see this red, it stops you even for part of a second. It's enough that you will perform worse on this type of test. I don't think it will influence when you have to write an, a long essay and all that, but on this type of test that you have to do quickly, like mathematical and uh, verbal tests like the one I showed you, it has the effect. Let's talk about the other association, which is sexual attraction, passion, etc. In this study, men sh were shown pictures, photos of a woman. If you see the, 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 the three uh, women above, at the top, they are all the same. Only one difference, as you can see very clearly, the color of the background they are depicted upon. Uh, one group of men saw the woman on, uh, against the red background. The other two groups saw it on different colors. They, they did it several times, so you have different women. But in each experiment, all the groups saw, all the men saw the same woman. And they were asked several questions about her, whether she, how, how attractive she is, how sexy and desirable she is. Uh, in some experiments, they asked, would you like to have sex with her? They were asked, would you like to date her? And how much, even in one experiment, they asked, how much money would you like to spend on her on a date? <laughs> and surprise, surprise, uh, the men who saw the woman on the red, against the red background, thought she was more attractive. She was sexier. They wanted to have sex with her more than they wanted with the other women, although they were the same women. And uh, even to spend more money on her on a date. In other words, just the fact that you, she was against a red background was enough to perceive her as more attractive. The interesting part is that when they were asked what made you think she's attractive or sexy, they did not think it was the color of the background. Some say the color of the hair or what she was wearing, and they changed it. They did several experiments. So once she was wearing uh, this type of, uh, of shirt, once she was wearing another type of shirt, they always thought it was something else and not the, the color of the background. So that's interesting, and I will talk at the end about implications for dating, etc. Uh, let's talk about texture. We s yeah. When they were asked that, were they shown the pictures of the same woman with different backgrounds and said, why did you pick this one over that? No, no, no. Each group got only one picture, uh, but they were divided randomly, and always this group had a higher uh, average. So how did they ask them, why did you say you would spend more money or you would? No, spend not money? more. This is a good question, but maybe I was not clear enough. They said, why did you think that woman is attractive? Okay. If you gave her five out of seven or what? And she said, yeah, because she has long hair or whatever. OK? And they were asked, then they were asked specifically about the, the color of the background. They said, it didn't affect me in my decision. Let's go back to texture. As you see, there are all these uh, metaphors. I had a rough time, smooth sailing, rough relationship. We use, again, 
And you have to ask yourself, why do you, we use this particular concrete concept rather than others when I want to say that I uh, had a bad day or something? So let's see if these metaphors, again, are not just figure of speech. So in one experiment, the participants were asked to complete a puzzle. The exact same puzzle was given to the two groups, only one difference. One group got very smooth parts of the puzzle, while the other group got very rough parts of the puzzle. So they touched something rough or smooth. Then they were given a, a ambiguous dialogue and had to uh, decide whether this dialogue was friendly or unfriendly, cooperative or competitive, whether it was a discussion or an argument. It was kind of ambiguous, so you could think what you want. And as you could imagine by now, uh, those that held the smooth parts thought the uh, interaction was more friendly, cooperative, and it was a discussion rather than an argument compared to those who held uh, the puzzle with the rough parts. I want to remind you, that it was not done while they were asked. First, in, this was done like in ostensibly different studies. So first they were holding the puzzle, then in ostensibly another study, they were asked that and still it affected them, which I think is more impressive than if you ask them while you're doing that. Another part of texture is hard and soft. And you can say hard person, a soft a negotiator, soft tactics, etc. So let's see again how they affect. In one study, some of the, stu of the participants were sitting on a hard chair and some of the participants were sitting on a soft chair. And then they were asked to imagine that they're at a car dealership uh, buying a car and they were asked to give two offers, assuming that their first offer was objected. Those that sat on a soft chair were less rigid compared to those who sat on a hard chair. They changed their, those who sat on a soft chair changed their offer more than those who sat on a hard chair. They were softer negotiators. But let's see if you touch something soft or hard, whether that happens too. So this is a very nice study, I think. Uh, the researchers stopped passerby uh, in the street and said there is going to be a magic show. And uh, you know that the magician always asks you to check the things that he or she holds, whether he hasn't got the tricks and the dove will come out of the handkerchief or something. So uh, in this case, some of the participants were asked to check a soft blanket. And some of the participants were asked to check a hard uh, wooden block. Supposedly, that was the thing that the magician will use in his tricks. Then the magic uh, uh, tricks never happened, and they said it was postponed. And in a sensibly different study, they were asked to listen to an interaction between an employee and a boss and to, to rate the employee. Again, those who held a hard block rated the employee as a harder person than those who held the soft blanket. And I want to remind you again, it was not at the same time. It was completely like they, they, they didn't even relate to that. That was a magician show, magic show, and then they went to the lab and did another thing. Okay. Now, as I you showed before, I want to talk a little bit about moral and cleaning. You know, we have many metaphors that talk about the association between physical cleaning and morality. He has dirty hands, clean conscious, uh, uh, washing away the sins, filthy liar, etc. So we use <coughs> these physical cleaning uh, words and concepts to describe something which is actually abstract, like a conscious. So let's see if that, that works. Here I want to tell you about a study that me and my students did in our lab. Uh, we wanted to see if people who wash themselves and are after a shower will cheat more or less on a test, if there is anything to do with that. So we did what we did. This is a study that we just submitted for publication. Um, two of my students went to the gym of Tel Aviv University and uh, asked people either before they went to the shower 
or immediately after they came out of the shower to complete uh, a questionnaire. And what was the questionnaire? We uh, constructed a very difficult questionnaire asking all kinds of general knowledge questions. We did several times before uh, in other studies and we, in a pretest, we found questions that they are ans they, they can be answered, but nobody knows the answer. Like in what year was the stethoscope uh, invented? Or what day and month and year some not very important uh, soccer player from 100 years ago was born? Questions like that that definitely nobody answers. And, uh, or politician, not very well that when he was born, etc. And we did pre pretests and we were sure that these questions nobody knows to answer. Now in this questionnaire we had 13 questions, four were very easy and nine were very difficult. So if somebody tells the truth, he or she actually says that they failed because they didn't know nine out of 13. What we did, we gave them the questionnaire and in order to measure their cheating behavior, we just let them self-score their own uh, questionnaire. We gave them the uh, answer key and we said, okay, see what you did and I don't need your original uh, questionnaire. You can tear it and throw it to the recycle bin. Just give me the, the page where you wrote, I answered correctly, so and so uh, question. So that way we could see who cheated. And what we found out is that participants who went out of the shower, were clean, cheated more than those who were before the shower. This is a little bit counterintuitive. I think, because you would have thought, and we thought too, that once you are pure from the inside, I mean outside, you will be pure from the inside. But then we thought a little bit more, and we did another study that uh, uh, also that how much people donate, and we found similar results. And what we think is that once you feel completely clean, it and there is an association between in clean being clean inside, you kind of feel you have a license to cheat because you have, you can do, a, I mean, I'm completely good and clean, so I can do a little bit, you know, cheating on a, on a test in the gym. Ooh, I don't even get money for that or anything, so I'll do that. Uh, and, uh, and I found out that there are studies that use this term license to cheat, but not with related, you know, not related to physical cleaning. But in some uh, situations, people feel they can do that. So what we found is that once you feel completely clean, it's kind of, okay, I'm pure. I don't need to be very, very, you know, honest. I, I can cheat a little bit. So that's, that's a s nice study, I think, that we did uh, with counterintuitive uh, result. What about vertical position? <coughs> vertical position, uh, you know, also we use a lot of metaphors. She looks up to her brother. Uh, she climbed the corporate ladder, etc., etc. So we use uh, up and down uh, to describe power and uh, in, in, in down to describe somebody who is not powerful. And uh, you can see that uh, people know that and mine is bigger. So uh, every, every country wants to see that to show I have the biggest and tallest building. And it's not only from, I think, from an architectural point of view, but really it, is sim it symbolizes power, um, you know, the, the, the tallest building. So, uh, I want to show you that we really represent, because we, you know that high is, uh, represents power and low represents powerless, but I want to show you that we really represent this powerful or power powerless dimension along a vertical dimension really in our head. So in order to do that, th there were studies that uh, showed people two pairs of, of words. One was the powerless and one was the powerful servant and master, for example. And they were asked, for example, identify as fast as possible the powerful word. Or in another study, uh, identify as fast as possible the powerless word. What happened was that if, for example, they were asked to identify as fast as possible the powerless word, and it was up, although it was supposed to be down, it took them longer than if it was employer up and employee down. Uh, and when you measure their action time, you see why is it, why is it uh, more difficult? I mean, you see that servant is powerless and master is powerful. But it's like you get two kind of contradictory information. You get that the servant is a powerless, but he's up. So it takes you a little bit longer 
to react correctly, which actually is a proof that we organize our thoughts along a vertical position. Uh, but I want to show you, I want to show you how, because you are here in Google, I think it's more interesting to show uh, that even the lengths of the lines matter. So in uh, this study, uh, researchers, uh, uh, as participants, sorry, were asked to evaluate a manager. And uh, they, they were told that the organization uh, has 126 employees, and they were told about their uh, average salary, just common. And then they, sh they were shown this chart, these two charts. And they were asked how important is the manager, how powerful that manager is. Uh, questions like you can see on the screen, I think that manager is a very strong uh, leader, is powerful in the company, has control, etc. And what happened was that those who saw, and I'll go back to show you the chart again, those who saw the chart with the longer vertical uh, line thought the manager was more powerful than those who saw the same thing and with the same description of the company, only the line was shorter, which shows that when you draw something in the website or whatever, the length of the line matters more than people realize. The, uh, the other way around is when uh, subjects were dis given a description of uh, a manager, again, very similar, two groups were given exactly the same description. It's a company with so-and-so uh, employees uh, with such and such average uh, salary, but one group was told that the manager is not a very powerful person in the company. The other group was told that the, he's very per powerful person. And then they were told to move uh, and to, to s they were told, please put the square that represents the manager wherever you want. And those who were told that the manager was not so powerful put it lower than those who thought they still put it above the others, but lower, which shows that the lengths of the uh, vertical position uh, is all along the vertical position, we really perceive it as more powerful or less powerful. Um, that's it. Okay, let's go to taste. We also use, he's a very sweet person. Uh, we use the words bitter person, love is sweet, etc. Uh, we don't have any results so far about bitter. Actually, I'm running in my lab now things about bitter, tasting bitter, and, and see if it affects your bitter behavior. But uh, I don't have results, so if you invite me again, I'll tell you. But uh, uh, I'll tell you about the study that was done. And uh, this, uh, uh, in this study, participants were divided to three groups. One group was asked to taste a, a sweet chocolate. The other one was asked to ch taste non-sweet crackers. And the third one was n didn't taste anything. And they were asked some things about, like, it's a marketing study, OK? Then the study was, was supposedly over. And they were told that there is a professor who really needs help, for, uh, uh, that the people will help him in, in his uh, experiments and participate, as, as you know, volunteer to participate in his experiments. And they were told he has no money and he cannot give you credit, but how many minutes would you like to volunteer? Those who ate the sweet chocolate volunteer for a greater, minutes, uh, a greater number of minutes than those who ate uh, the non-sweet <coughs> crackers or didn't taste anything, which shows that when you eat something sweet, you're a sweeter person, at least for a short while. Uh, you know, so. Well, think about the implications. I'll talk, I, I'll talk a little bit at the end. Uh, this is a very nice study, which I put immediately after tasting, although it's because it's related to, uh, to uh, food, but it's not about food, actually. It's about the influence of logos on our behavior. And I think, again, in Google, it's especially important. Uh, you know, there are all these kind of logos that we see all around us. We walk and we see logos. We don't even pay attention. If I ask you, what did you see? Probably you will not remember most of them, but we do see them. So there are several studies that were done on how fast food logos influence our behavior. Because when you think, what is a fast food? What that is, it represents? It represents that we, we have to do something fast. We 
no patience to sit in a restaurant, wait for each dish, etc. That's what it implies too. It implies also other things, but I'm talking about the word fast here. So uh, fast food logos were flashed subliminal, subliminally for 12 milliseconds. Subliminally, I'm sure you know, but I'll just say it in case, uh, that consciously you don't know that you saw these logos, but they were flashed on the screen. And to another group, uh, some just squares uh, were flashed on the screen. And then they were asked to read uh, a paragraph. Those who were exposed to the fast food logo, without their awareness, read the paragraph faster than those who uh, were exposed to, to just squares. In a second study, uh, they were asked, again, they, they were asked, here time, he, this time they were not exposed subliminally, but they were asked to remember a time that they went to a fast food place, like McDonald's or, or any other KFC, or the other group was asked to remember a time that they went to a grocery store. Then they were asked to say how, how desirable these products are, and as you can see on the screen, there are products that are time-saving, like a toaster with four slices, or shampoo and condition in the same uh, in the same bottle. And they were asked to say how desirable they are, each for each product, the one that saved more time or less time. And those who remembered that they went to the fast food, uh, like McDonald's or anything else, preferred the time-saving products like the toaster with the four slices or the uh, bottle that contains both shampoo and conditioner, which shows that they really, really, it affected that. The, <coughs> the last one <coughs> that I'm not showing all the details was that those who were exposed to uh, fast food logos wanted, when they were, gave the option, they were given the option, wanted their money immediately rather than waiting and save it and get some more money, they were more impatient. So next time you're standing in, in a red light and uh, you honk with somebody doesn't move, think it might be because you saw the logo of uh, McDonald's and, and then try not to be manipulated by that. <laughs> now, this is definitely that I, you know, I chose, uh, in my book I have many more that I will not show today, but of course when I prepared this lecture I thought for Google I have to talk about creativity, of course. And uh, if you look at this picture here, you see that uh, there are two metaphors actually. One is uh, thinking out of the box, which I'll talk in a minute, yeah? And the other one is the light bulb. Uh, in many comics, uh, you, you portray the, the light bulb above the head of somebody as it's a new innovation. Ah, I found something. I'm sure you know this experience of aha experience. It's when you uh, think about a problem and you don't know and it's not a process. You just, you're stuck. And suddenly you have the answer and this is called the aha experience. It's like you say, aha, here it is. And I could give you many examples uh, about that. And, uh, and we use metaphors like shedding light on the problem or I saw the light. So let's see if indeed, if you see a light bulb or if you see it out of the box, it will increase your creativity. So the first one was uh, about, uh, about the light bulb. So here, uh, a, the, the subject, I will show you exactly here. They were given a, a problem, which I don't know how many of you know, to connect four dots with three lines and you are, you are not allowed to go over the same line again. If somebody knows this answer, don't tell me. Okay, what happens here is that you have to get out of the boundaries of the four dots and then it's very easy as I'll show you in a minute. So participants were given this uh, problem and 55 seconds later they were told, the experiment said, I think it's a little bit dark here, let me turn on the light. For one group he turned on a light bulb, which was, uh, they saw it very clearly. For the other group, he turned on a fluorescent light. And then, those that saw the light bulb solved the problem more often than those who saw the fluorescent. And the, the solution is here. You see, you get out of the boundaries, and immediately 
it's very easy. You do like that, like that, and like that. But you have to think. When, you, when, when I saw this problem at b- the beginning, I didn't know because I tried like that, like that, and I couldn't. Then once you know that you can go out, when they saw the light bulb, there was a better chance that they will solve the problem, which is really nice, I think. Um, the other uh, uh, metaphor is sitting outside of the box or inside a box. So they built a big box, and <laughs> s- half of the subject sat inside the box, uh, but it was a big box. And the other sat outside, and they really saw a box, and they sat outside the box. Uh, <laughs> and then they were told uh, to solve the following problem. And let me see if anybody of you, it's called, it, this is a very standard creativity test. It's called remote association test. And you're asked uh, to find one word that is related to all these three words. In this case, what, let me see if you know, what is the word that is associated with both measure, warm, and video? Yeah, very good. So it's tape. And, uh, and there are many words like that, and you have to be creative to, to think about it because they are, you, know, you have to go get out of the box. So indeed, those who were sitting outside of the box solved more problems than those who sat inside the box. These are direct implications. Don't even to say that. Just go out of the box. Uh, this is a study that I decided to include at the last minute because it's something we are doing in my lab uh, with my student, Alon Cohen, who is my PhD student, and it's about stability. We talk about physical stability, and then we talk about emotional stability, and we talk about stability of companies. So we are doing some things about the association between physical stability and emotional stability, but here I'll show you a little bit only about the association between physical stability and the stability, perceived stability of companies. So what we did was we showed them several logos. Uh, Some logos, if you look at the top uh, line, you will see that all these logos are stable compared to the second row, right? They are less stable. And we we asked uh, about each logo which company do you think this logo represents? And we gave them six companies that we found on pretest that three are considered more stable, which are uh, insurance companies, uh, accounting companies. They are more. They are boring, but they are less. But they are less. Uh, they are more stable compared to advertising or internet companies, which are considered less stable. And this we found on a pretest. And indeed. More people uh, gave uh, thought that the stable logos belong to stable companies. But the more interesting, I think, s- stuff is wha- the second study, where we described a, a company and we asked them to attribute the appropriate logo to, the, to that company. One company was a, a more stable company, as I said, maybe more boring. And the other one was advertising company, which is uh, less stable, considered less stable. And uh, here are the results. I think they are very nice in interaction. Those that uh, they, they, the participants attributed the more to the more stable companies, the more stable logos, and to the less stable companies, the less stable co- uh, logos. This is really new. We just finished writing the, the, the paper to that, and we have more. Com- uh, I just wanted to to enter some to put in something that we we are doing in our lab. So I can go on and on about studies, but I want to talk a little bit about what does it mean. And as I said, there are many things I didn't touch. So how does it work? What happens is that according to uh, embodied cognition, which I started my lecture, our physical sensations are grounded in our I'm sorry, I, our, our emotional sensations are grounded in our physical sensations. And when we are children, we learn that our parents embrace us and we feel the warmth of their touch. And this is what we learn first about warmth. We learn also that when we lie down as children and it's dark, it's frightening, and we associate then darkness with negativity and light with positivity. We learn that all grown-ups are much taller than us, and they are powerful. What can we do? I mean, even the short grown-ups 
are, are taller than us, and they are powerful. So we learn to associate vertical position with power. And the idea is, is like in the scaffolding process, like a layer by layer, like you build a house. You have the layer of the physical sensations, the, uh, the concrete concepts that children learn when they are small, and on them we build on and on these uh, abstract concepts like warm personality, soft negotiator, <coughs> uh, emotional distance, powerful person, etc. And then when we touch a warm object, it activates, yes, it activates the concept of warm personality because they are related to each other and that's the idea behind that um, it's it's relatively it might it might look uh, it might look a little shallow but uh, the reason is not because it's shallow it's and I want to say something about that I think it's the first generation of these studies uh, all the studies that I showed you are from the last six or seven years some of them were from last year or so. They're really, really new. And uh, like in many other areas of science, once you show this phenomena, which is really amazing, I mean, that the metaphors are not just figure of speech, now we have to examine more carefully what other moderator variables happen, whether it affects some people more than others. Uh, for example, they never study that, and that's my plan for next year whether some people are more affected by environmental cues or physical sensations than others, whether perhaps in some environments it happens more than in others. Maybe to touch a warm cup when it's hot outside is different when you touch when it's cold outside. Nobody did that yet. So we have to do all these experiments as the second generation to see uh, when and when, uh, when and it happens more, when it happens less, and why to examine more ages, more cultures. There are many things to be done after you've, show, you've seen this amazing, I think, phenomena. But still, even when we, did, we didn't do all this, uh, it's somewhat, uh, as uh, the Sunday Time wrote about the, my book, they said some are very funny, interesting, and some are alarming. Because we would like to think that we are in control of our decisions. It's not a very comfortable thought to hear that just because I touched something warm, I decided differently. Or just because I was sitting on a soft chair, I gave, I mean, I lost some money because I, I decided I'll sell my house on a cheaper price. Uh, you want to think that you are in charge of, of your decisions and your emotions and not that some arbitrary things like environmental cues affect us. So people don't want to listen to that, but in fact, it is true that they do affect us all the time. And uh, I think they have many implications. First of all, before I show the implication, I want to tell you that I think once you know that, and there are many more that I didn't, I didn't talk about, but once you know that you are affected, you are more aware of that, and you are less manipulated. And that's very important. Because when you judge somebody who is very tall as a powerful person, and then you ask yourself, did I do that because he was tall, or he was sitting on a higher chair? You ask yourself, and then you are more conscious of that, and you will do it less. So, uh, and, and many others, for example, the, the, the association between physical distance and emotional distance. There are many things that when you know that, you ask yourself this question, and then maybe you will be less manipulated. But you can use it also for your benefit when you do something like negotiations. If you negotiate with somebody, and you want uh, the negotiation to be a nice atmosphere and the other person to judge you as a warmer person, to be warmer. First of all, think about the height of the chair. Think about the softness of the chair that you give the other person. Bring only a hot beverage like espresso <laughs> or tea. Don't give any cold beverage like Coke or any, or beer is another story altogether, but, <laughs> but, uh, but don't give any other, uh, but hot, um, a, a hot beverage maybe give something sweet, and you will see the difference. <laughs> that person will give you all his house for free. <laughs> Not that, no, that, but it might tip this, <laughs> just tip the scale to your direction, and, and it's, it's, it's worth trying. It's, not, it's true only, not only when you negotiate in business negotiating, but when you negotiate with your children, or when your children are grown up, and you want to, to have the very important, not very easy talk with them. 
And of course, it has implications for dates. So first of all, of course, we're great. And as you see, give the other person something warm so it will enhance the trust, the generosity, and the judgment, the way one person judges the other. So it has all these implications, which I just started to talk. And uh, <coughs> thank you very much. <coughs>